stay home for labor Isolate in solidarity Let's get together on Zoom See into people's bedrooms We're all voyeurs for free Stay home for labor Keep crisping as your MC Get used to the smell of your fragrant hand gel Hands like an ancient mummy I said stay home for labor Wave your toilet rolls in the air real quick Have a laugh, have a sup Keep your spirits up Cause when this is all over We've got some asses to kick I said stay home, stay home for labor We are out and proud about doing this as Labour Party because this is a, not just about the Labour Party, but it's tapping into that community spirit that we we thought we'd lost in our heartlands, um, and we clearly haven't. I'm Jane Marshall. I've been a Labour Party member for 30 years during the election. We had an excellent community organiser and helping us, and he instilled in us how important it was that we should be rooted in the community. We thought about this idea of opening up this community hub. This shop was open, hadn't been used for a while. We pulled the sh shutters up and then all our members helped decorate it all. I didn't know all members could do it. We had an electrician, painter, um, somebody come and checked um, all the wiring. We had people donating stuff, painting. Um, so it was really, really member-led. Over the past 18 months, we've always had food outside on a, a shelf, on a rack. And then we say, um, if you need, take, and if you can, donate. So it's always had food there. And a lot of people, again, within the community come and take some food and others donate it. But then when we were told we had to shut the shop um, because of the crisis, the pandemic, we thought, no, we've really, really got to still reach out to these people that are vulnerable and that have relied on us over the past 18 months. Um, so we put a notice on the door saying, if you want a food parcel, contact this number. And that was my number. And it's gone from that, which was one or two bags a week. And last week we did 136 bags. We fed over a thousand people, raised £7,000 from our members and supporters. We've had a lot of lovely messages, a lot of thank yous. Um, and it, you know, people have said, this is the first time some of my children have had food in the belly in the last week. The elderly were told to isolate, so they did, but then they couldn't do online shopping. So we filled that gap. When people phone up, we say we're Broxdale Labour. We send the food out in the, the Labour carrier bags. <laughs> so they do know it's us that's doing it. And this is what was done in the miners' strike and before that. This is what we should be doing, getting back into our communities. And we've reached communities that we've never even been um, we've door knocked at elections, but we haven't really got a hold into what that community needs. And this is just the start of it. This is what the Labour Party needs going forward. Welcome to Stay Home for Labour, Jane Marshall. How are you, Jane? I'm all right, thank you, yes. What I wanted to do at the start of this show, which is looking at the finances and the structure of the Labour Party, is to look at what would be an ideal way for constituencies to operate. It, you know, it's amazing what you're doing as an outreach to people who are struggling in, in Broxtow, you know, in, in, around Nottingham. Um, so. Tell us, how, how did you actually fund that hub that you've got there? Um, we've had it for about 18 months now, and it was initially funded by uh, the unions, Unite and CWU, um, because it was before a general election and we were a marginal campaigning office. But since then, this is funded by our members um, with a little bit of money from Unite still. But this is what's possible when you've got a well-resourced uh, local Labour Party to have one of these community hubs. Um, benefits not only the members but also the community because food bank is only one of the things that we've done since the pandemic but we were doing a number of activities within the community right in their heartlands um, for the past 18 months it's a visible sign that labor's here both for our members and for the community and i just don't know why we're not funding it nationally or through the unions or through the wider labor movement i think i'm the ray of sunshine before the rest of the discussion aren't i well, you're, you're the way forward, I, I, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, That's I my ambition. I mean, the country's going to be, 
really struggling in the next few months and probably even beyond that. Um, so we need as much support um, for people. And if Labour can provide that, then we're showing that we mean business and we don't just talk about how we can help people, we actually do. Um, how much does it cost you to run that hub? Without, um, you know, it, I want the yeah. tax man isn't here listening, I, I believe. No, I think the tax man just give us £10,000 because we're a shop anyway for a rateable value, um, which is nice. Um, but yes, we've uh, funded it. It costs £5,000 a year. Um, and most of it is, um, we say to our members, it costs each member 50p a month to run. Um, and some donate more and some don't, which is fine. So that's part of our fundraising. But the unions did give us uh, a couple of thousand each year um, to pay for the other parts of the rent or the internet. But now it is members. We decided after the election, January, a difficult decision whether we wanted to renew the, the lease. But all the members said it's been it's transformed our CLP. We have all our branch meetings here. It's a safe space for our young uh, members, our LGBT our women. Um, we have our political education here, coffee for comrades. The public can come in at any point, walk in advice centre for people. And it's as I say, it's my mission, but it is the funding. The funding we get from our treasurers on the line on here, but the funding we get from national party is only a year, two thousand five hundred for the CLP. That's not for here. That wouldn't fund this. And that's what I'm saying. So you are, you are asking, you are yeah. asking the members to cover um, more yeah. than their subscription fee to do that? Yeah, the subscription fee we get from National, yes. Okay. So we need National to fund one of these in every major right. city on every high street. All right, well, look, thank you, Jane. I've got so many people uh, who I'm going to ask about what their situation is. So I'll move on. But yeah. um, thank you again for coming on. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to start with um, talking to um, Paul in, in Sedgefield. Are you there, Paul? Yeah, I'm here. Um, so in Sedgefield, you've lost your MP uh, in the last election and neighbouring seats as well have lost their MP. So like Bishop Auckland and is it Darlington? Northwest, Northwest Durham and Darlington, yeah. Northwest Durham. So they've all lost their, their party office as well. So that means that you've got no offices in those constituencies, is that right? Um, no, we've, we've got no, actually Bishop Auckland do have the premises that they used to use, like Bishop Auckland owned a building and, uh, and they used to rent that to their MP uh, and they did some good work out of that. But Bishop Auckland have come up with the idea very generously to try and locate a premises on, uh, on the border of three constituencies to try and get us to maybe get um, a community organiser to base themselves there. Because we think that in this area of the world where we were, we were called the Red Wall, we feel like we're, we're a little bit ne neglected and you know people have worked extremely hard around here. Like the Labour Party staff did work incredibly hard, but there aren't very many of them. So that makes it very, very difficult. And I think they expect us, seats like ours, to, to just win. But we could see the decline kicking in. And so, we want to be more involved in the community everywhere. It, it is obviously a big problem for those red wall seats that have lost their, their infrastructure to try and um, rebuild. Uh, and, you know, financially, how many members have you got uh, in, in, in uh, Sedgefield? 700-ish. 700 so yeah. if we look at i mean this is this is a little bit out of date because the it's gone up a little bit to like um i think it's gone up to two pounds 60 uh it's gone up a massive 10p uh, a year but yeah. um this is what you would get if everyone paid full subscription fee for the labor party so you get two pounds 60 times 600 um, well, from what Jane said, um, you probably get somewhere for about three months or four months. Yeah. We wouldn't um, be getting anywhere with that. But the, um, the, the problem we do have is that people do, like we do need to fund the Labour Party infrastructure. And we do, like we've got the National Communication Centre up in Newcastle. And they are not particularly high paid workers. They, com they communicate with all the members across the country. So that's quite an important thing. So we have to consider that those people who are doing a good job within the Labour Party do
do need to be funded. But the idea of just getting £2.50 or £2.60 a year per member, you know, we could do we could do a lot with that money. We don't necessarily need like offices in Southside, really, really expensive places. Um, it would be really beneficial if we could get a bigger slice of that and actually become more involved in our communities. Especially with, with, with your being a seat that we all need to win um, if we're going to get back into power and you need the, the people on the ground. I'm sorry, I, I just realised I've talked to you far too long. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to move on now to um, Sean in... Uh, in Where is he? He's in Barrow in Furness. Sean. You're oh. another seat that Labour lost, one of the red wool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, although we did have John Woodcock, so uh, <laughs> it was debatable about the loss. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest thing we we missed, once you lose your MP, you lose the money, because we, we do have premises, and we were getting uh, decent rent money off uh, the MP, sort of, uh, which kept our kind of premises going. It's been a bit of a struggle since then. Uh, luckily, we one of the flaws of our, our building is uh, flat. So that kind of pays the mortgage because we've had the building for a long time. But it just means we 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 constantly looking for money. Members are paying to go to meetings. Uh, the EC chipping to, when you go into the office. All that kind of stuff just means that you're just not doing any community-based work at all as a party. Right. And even if they, we just got, you know, if we if we got seven pound fifty per member instead of the two pound fifty, it's just amazing what we could actually do in our community. We could go out and help people and do what the Labour Party was set up to do, which is, uh, it just feels like you're just there purely to go out on the doorstep for elections. To be honest, yeah, and 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 like you say, all that time you spend. Um, trying to raise funds. I mean, I've been doing fundraisers for about eight years. It's it's so time consuming, trying to get people to turn up for things, trying to encourage them to, to buy tickets, raffle tickets, all that kind of thing. Imagine if that time was spent doing something for, like you say, for the community. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Joe in Stoke South. Hey, old mate, you all right? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, another seat that Labour's got to got to win. So what what's your um, financial situation? Do you have an office? Do you have the resources to to win back Stoke South? Um, the resources in our constituency are, are, aren't very good. In terms of the finances, we're not too bad, but we don't have we don't have an office. There's no union buildings in this end of the city that we can kind of loan during an election time or camp out in. Um, I think we really need to start looking at like what Broxter were doing. That really needs to be replicated around the area because right now we just haven't got a presence in Stoke on in Stoke on Trent. We've only got three councillors in this end of the city out of fifteen. It's we're you know if we're not when we're not winning elections, we've got to ask ourselves what do, what are we here for? And we've we know just because we haven't got the MPs, just because we haven't got the councillors, doesn't mean we can't be out there helping people. We know we need we should still be putting on advice surgeries just because we're not the councillor. We should be putting on advice surgeries, and that's why we need premises. That's why we need something like we need to replicate the Brockstone model. And you, do you think you could do with a bit more than two pounds sixty? Uh, a year for each member. Oh, de de definitely, yeah. We need. What sort of figure? What what sort of figure would would you look for? Uh, considering there's fifty quid, um, about fifty quid as a as a membership subscription. How much do you think should go to the CLPs from that? Well, it is a case of if we if we could at least get like a tenner per person, then it's then that's going to be. Oh, you're bit, you're, I just want to. I just want to check what everyone's saying. So you're saying a tenner. I'll put Joe down for tenner. All right. Uh, no, you know, if people are going higher, I'll jump on the bandwagon and go higher. <laughs> so I'm being a little bit, a little bit. I don't want to say the word conservative there. Offsetting. I no, better not say that. Yeah, all right. Right look. I'm gonna, um, thanks, Joe. I'm, I'm going to move up to um, 
Scotland to uh, Dumbarton. Alan, are you there? That's right. Hi all. Uh, yeah, my name's Alan Sorrell and I'm the treasurer of uh, Dumbarton CLP. Now, uh, our organisation is slightly different in Scotland in that uh, our CLPs are graded round uh, the Scottish parliamentary seats and uh, not the Westminster seats. So uh, for Westminster elections, we are paired up with a neighbouring CLP. Our neighbouring CLP is completely broke to the point that they can't even hold meetings and uh, uh, they are in effect inactive. So when there's an election, uh, Dumbarton CLP ends up picking up all the costs. Now that does cause a little bit of animosity because uh, uh, people in Dumbarton will see, are saying, well, you know, our, the money we have uh, saved hard uh, to use in elections is now having to go somewhere else because another CLP can't afford it. Uh, our assets, we have uh, a, an old hall, which uh, I suppose the best way of describing it would be like an old church hall which is uh, split into two. The front part of the hall uh, is used as a, a dance studio by a, a young lady who uh, runs uh, dance schools for all the uh, kids in the underprivileged areas. Now, we, we stay in an area which suffers quite badly from social deprivation, so uh, we've been quite supportive of her and uh, we give her, it's almost a, a, a nominal rent she pays each month. It's not really enough to keep uh, the hall going because it is an old hall, it needs repaired. And uh, just after the, I don't know if you remember, uh, in Scotland we had the uh, independence referendum. Oh, yeah. on, on the weekend of that referendum, after the vote, uh, where the, the no campaign in effect won, our hall was firebombed. So we were actually attacked and the hall was burnt out. And uh, unfortunately, the, the insurance cover uh, wouldn't provide, uh, wouldn't pay for the, the full reinstatement of the inside of the hall. So we had to seriously fundraise to get that done. And right. uh, thankfully, with uh, some donations and some uh, sizable donations from uh, some of our trade union colleagues, we managed so, to do so that. So I, I, I don't want to interrupt you. It's just I know there's a lot of other um, CLPs. I'm, I'm just Sorry. keen to. Um, so your neighbouring CLP has no money and you're backing um, that one up. Um, yes. And you're um, also trying to. Um, keep a, a building going, the running keep costs are not, going. Um, zero. Yeah. Um, so do you think that you could do with a bit more money from the central um, party, the me membership subscriptions? Well, uh, I'm hoping there's no debt from the NEC uh, uh, paid too much attention to this because uh, years ago we were told to transfer the, the whole, the hall was held in a trust and we were told to transfer that trust to uh, Labour Properties. Uh, and we looked at doing that, but it costs money and uh, it costs so much that we couldn't actually afford to do it. And that's the position we're in, is uh, we have no real money to campaign outside elections. There's lots of things we'd love to be doing and uh, we have to combat that, but we can't because uh, we just don't have the money to do it. And that's despite uh, my uh, member of the Scottish Parliament is Jackie Bailey, who some of you may know is the deputy uh, leader in Scotland. It doesn't help us at all. We still have very, very little money to do what we'd love to do, and that's get out and campaign and spread the the, the labour work to everybody we can. Right. Okay. Um, thank you very much for coming on, uh, and I love your background on there. I know where you're. I know what country you're from. From that background. <laughs> good. Um, good. <laughs> and um, uh, Martin in Birmingham. Are you there? Yeah, here, here, Crispin. Yeah, uh, actually, in, in Solihull, West Midlands. Um, I'll c make a couple of quick points. I mean, first of all, I think that the current level of money clearly doesn't allow um, constituencies to, to to engage in very much activity at all. In fact, we've had a number of years. I mean, we're a two constituency party. We roughly get just over two thousand pounds in terms of subs income. We are relatively lucky in that we've got a social club where we do get a rental income from that. And we've also got a very successful monthly members draw. So we probably have for the two constituencies an annual income of about £8,000, of which 2000 is from the uh, national office. That could change, of course, um, uh, quite quickly. Um, just just in terms, I mean, and actually on the national money, 
uh, we, we quite regularly get requests to pay it back. So there was one year where we got our £1,800 subs income and suddenly there was a, um, I think it was a Metro Mayor election and each constituency was levied nearly £1,000 for that particular election. So that was one year where actually came in one minute and went out the next. Um, just in relation to this discussion, is that I think we've got to be really careful not just to talk about carving up the cake in a slightly different way. We've got to grow the cake. And I actually think that the more we get constituencies having control and management of their own local resort resources, the much more likely it is that we're going to be, dare I use the word entrepreneurial? I will, um, entrepreneurial, so that we actually work out ways that we can raise money in all sorts of different ways. So I think, um, and, and I, I also think, to, the final thing I'd say is that I do think that money follows politics. I think that basically we've largely got quite a top-down centralist, centralised organisation uh, and the money and how it's distributed reflects that. I think we probably need to address that issue in different ways. And okay. I'll throw on the table, you know, for example, you know, uh, how can you say you're a, a, a member and constituency-led party if you're only getting that small percentage of income? How can you say you're a membership and community-led party if uh, only nine out of the 41 NEC members actually represent constituencies? I just think we have to address the whole issue and making sure that we devolve our own party uh, and clearly there's a role also in terms of what role of regional office you know um, many of our regional offices play absolutely no bloody role I, in right I've got, to, I've got to move on martin you, you, you thank you for that for that um i, I bet you're good in the meetings uh, <laughs> uh i'll i'll go now to um andrew in basildon but you could be you're sort of like a a marginal on, on, on a good day for Labour, it could be a marginal. It could do, yeah, but I think in 2010, when they sort of redone the boundaries, um, it made it unmarginable then sort of thing. And um, so we always fall down the pecking order when it comes to money and all that. Unions don't want to support us, they don't. So it's absolutely crazy. And um, after the uh, general election, up into May, we had £59 left in our... Um, in our account it's just absolutely shocking i had to at a general election i had to um, loan the party 400 pounds to pay for leaflets that's how bad it got how many members have you got there a thousand members nearly but yeah. it's just like all the money keeps on going out like to pay for essex county labor party it goes to like eastern region labor party so all the time you're just like you're losing money and it's just like it's shocking so you're you're getting money you're getting a small amount of money in and then they're asking you to pay other things from that money yeah yeah right i'm going to move <laughs> on to um janine yes um, hi janine yeah, so we're from west dorset we're in the heart of the tory southwest um we don't have any councillors so we don't get any money that way um, we've got around a thousand members, so we're quite a big constituency. Wow. But um, uh, we have three branches, we have no buildings, so most of our expenditure is trying to, to get local halls, many of which aren't really very suitable. We're a very big geographical constituency, so trying to get people to come to centralised meetings is really difficult. Um, and really the, the thing for us is the cost of participation in democracy. So we want to send people to conference, we want to send as many people as possible because it's a really good way of getting people active when they see the party machinery. But the costs of conference, women's conference, regional conference just takes all of our money. And we would love to do some community organising, we've been talking about it for years, but we just don't have any kind of money to be able to do that because all our money is taken up with just participating in the democracy of the, of the, um, of the party. Oh, well, I, I'm really sorry to hear that. It's good to see you again. F Philip in Middlesbrough, South and East Cleveland. What's the situation there? Do you have, a, do you have an office? Do you have uh, resources? No, we don't. Um, uh, pretty much like most of the, uh, the, the other speakers tonight, uh, we don't basically. 
Um, we were scrabbling around in the last election uh, last year for, for an office. Uh, for contrast that with 2017, um, we were fortunate in that um, a local member um, was moving out of what was a, an artist's big studio, a cooperative, and we had the use of that for the entire um, election, and it made a huge difference. It was, it was filled with activists all the time. Bearing in mind, this was just uh, leading up to an election. Um, and we, we came very close in 2017. Um, there are all sorts of issues why we lost. Um, the Conservatives kind of took it from, uh, from us by about a 1,000 uh, votes. Uh, fast forward to uh, last year, uh, the Conservatives increased their, their uh, majority to 11,000. And we struggled to, to find a property. Um, we found a very small property in one, one of the constituency towns um, into the campaign. So um, we were on the back foot straight away. If we want to be a member-led party, then give us the money. We, we at the CLP level should be having the lion's share of the membership money. Because if that happens, unfortunately, money and power go together. The power would then come to the CLPs. We could do what we know needs to be done in our own communities. It's not just about money. It's not just about getting more money. No matter how much of the membership money we get, we're always going to be lagging behind the Conservatives in their funding. So we've got to be clever with it and it's got to be spent sensibly. And uh, local members know what needs to be done. They need to be given the power. I want to move on again to Bruce, are you there? Yes, I'm here. So Edinburgh, I mean, Labour's wiped out pretty much in, in Scotland. Um, yeah. Has Labour actually been able to come back into that at all? No, we've slipped down from second to third place in uh, most elections. You know, in Edinburgh Western, it's uh, Christine Jordan is the Lib Dem MP. Uh, the MSP is Alex Cole Hamilton. And the two, two of the councillors are Lib Dem. They've got so much money. We, we keep questioning whether it's uh, fair and legal and follows the electoral rules, but they get away with it. And they put out glossy leaflets during campaigns at least once a week, and they just bombard voters. Now, a lot of those votes are not going to come our way at the moment, but um, the only other thing just in Western, you know, we're not too bad for money, uh, but obviously, as I said in that clip at conference, I, was say, I, I went on just after Dennis Skinner and I said, let's take Dennis's advice. He was saying, how do you fund all these great uh, social projects? You borrow from the banks, you borrow from the centre. And that's what we should do. What, why, when we've boosted our membership so much under Jeremy Corbyn, is, not, is more of that not flowing back from the centre to us? And, uh, and at least if, if we could borrow it, you know, we might might take years to pay it back, but at least you know they know that we'd be good for it. So, oh well, thank you, thank you, Bruce. And I'm I'm going to bring in Judith from Forest of Dean. So t tell us your story because I think you you've got an issue with uh, property because obviously um, Broxstow have this hub. I mean, it would be good if every CLP had a property to to work from. What's the situation with Forest of Dean's property? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting story, and I think it's gross injustice, which is why I wanted to talk about it. Uh, like the gentleman in Scotland, we were told by Labour Properties that we had to transfer the building to their ownership. Now, this hall was built in 1930 by the Transport and General Workers Union. It's always been paid for by the local party. It's been upkept by the local party, worth about 200000 The Labour Party have taken that away from us. Not only did they take us away, not give us any money, they made us pay the legal fees of nearly £2,000 for doing it. And that was half the money that we had in the accounts at the time. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, the, Forest of, the Forest of Dean is not a particularly wealthy area. We were a very good Labour area up until about four general elections ago. Uh, but now we're, um, we've got Mark Harp as our MP and he's got quite a big majority and we've got no money to fight him. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I, I might actually um, come back to um, David um, Cutfield in Milton Keynes. Dave, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, yeah, hi. Um, now, we, we spoke uh, yesterday um, as a preliminary to this show. Um, yeah. This property issue, uh, you, you own a, your, your CLP, your 
Milton Keynes is two CLPs, but you have a property there. What's happening in the Forest of Dean and what happened with Milton Keynes and I think a few other ones around the country is that they're being transferred to this nominee company. So they kind of, the, the property doesn't disappear, but it's kind of then a bit ambiguous about who really owns it because the CLP still get to use it. They're still responsible for repairing it and can do what they want with it, but the party owns it. So you can't do anything major or sell it or anything you wanted to because it's in fact controlled by this nominee company. So it's a very complicated structure. And it's normally only done like that for reasons of, you know, billionaires and stuff structure their empires that way in order to avoid tax normally. But I'm not sure why Labour's done it that way. And it's like another thing, there's no information. You look at their accounts company's house, it doesn't tell you anything. So it's just another sort of black hole of information. So you can't really work out what's going on. I mean, I heard a rumour once that those properties were used to secure loans on in the past, but I don't know if there's any truth to that. I'm going to play um, our interview that we had uh, yesterday. So, because I cut it and edited it, and, and it's about five minutes long, but it explains your um, views on the Labour Party accounts and the way finances are run. Um, and you're, you're a, a professional accountant um, as well as a member and a treasurer in Milton Keynes. So that, that's to introduce who, who you are. And this is, um, this is a conversation I had with. Uh, David last night I'd, I'd say my impression of the annual report is um, it's the bare legal minimum right so they, they give you about as much information as as they need to there's a lot of information that's missing in there they don't have to legally give it to us but I think there's stuff in there they should so for example if you're a PLC if you're a listed company you must list the pay and pensions and bonuses of all your directors, right? I think Labour should probably do the same for its senior management if they want to be honest and open, but they don't. In the um, accounts, they should be open and honest about what they spend the money on. But so, for example, if you go into our accounts, they tell you, for example, how much we've spent on um, like commercial activities. They'll say, oh, we spent three, 3.6 million. They don't tell you what that is. There's no breakdown of it. They have items in the accounts like 3.2 million of other income. They don't tell you what that is. You know, there's all this sort of information that would be really useful and that an open organisation should give, but they're just not giving it. I, I don't feel like the finances are run properly. I, don't, I couldn't even tell you who's in charge of finances at the Labour Party. I know who the Treasurer is, but I know that she's also an Assistant um, Secretary General at one of the unions, so I know she's not spending much time being Labour Party Treasurer, but I've looked on the internet, I can't tell you who's in charge of the finances of Labour and who looks after on a day-to-day -day basis, and you wouldn't find that in a private sector company or even a charity. They would let you, you'd be able to go on the internet, and you'd, you'd know who's, who the finance director is or who the chief finance officer is, but we don't seem to have that fund. The phrase is used probably 10 or 15 times in there, they talk about a general election trust fund. So they're building up a reserve of money to fight your election. But nowhere in their accounts does it tell you what that figure is. And if they were more honest and said, we've got 10 million, and guess what? 2 million of that is set aside for our top 100 seats, they're all going to share that equally, and another million for the next 100. You know, if they, if they explained it and were more honest about it, then decisions could be made on the ground and people would be able to plan more effectively. But essentially, everyone was just waiting to see what would happen. And we waited and waited. I mean, and then the election's called, it's like, oh, great, well, now we've got this, our candidates are racing around trying to get money out of unions, trying to get money off members, instead of actually going on and fighting and campaigning for the election. So it's not the money, it's the systems and processes around that. And I guess another example of that is um, in that leaked report about allocating an extra 50,000 or, or whatever it was to Tom Watson. I just don't understand how that could possibly happen. Um, you know, how people could be a conversation on WhatsApp or have a discussion decide that all of a sudden one seat deserves more money than another one. I don't, I don't actually know if it happened or if it was, you know, I, I know, I saw the conversation, I don't actually know if those funds went to Tom Watson's seat or not, but I don't understand how a small group of people can, can have this sort of power to, to make big changes like that. It, it doesn't strike me as a well-run organisation, if that's possible. I don't think Labour Live is a bad idea, so I don't understand now why they're trying to pretend it didn't happen. Just be honest about it. Just put your hands up and say, we spent all this money on it. We shouldn't have done it. We've learned our lesson. 
Could, but it makes you think, if those are the things they've wasted money on that we know about, what things have they wasted money on that we don't know about? And if, they, if they're not very transparent about things, or only as transparent as they're forced to be by the, by the Electoral Commission, you know, they do the bare legal minimum, if they're only going to be that transparent, why should we trust them? Finances of the party aren't really discussed and not really politicised. It's sort of, sort of a, a non-discussion point, which is why it's really good that we're talking about it, because it's actually really important, as I said before, if it's run badly, it's not just a case of not having the money, but if you don't organise your money and communicate and be transparent enough, it has real consequences on the ground. We do have uh, a couple of members of the NEC here, um, and we've also got a former uh, long-standing member of the NEC, Govinda, are you there? I'm, I'm here, yeah. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Uh, do NEC members have the, the resources themselves to actually scrutinise the accounts and make sure that money is going to the right places? What, what's, what's your position? So, what, my, my position, so I think the, you're talking about basic governance over here. Um, and I, I, you know, with my background with governance in other places, I came on to the NEC just a couple of months ago, um, and I asked for one of the things I asked for was the last set of the, the last budget uh, and the last monitoring report, um, and I haven't been provided it, um, and there's no intention to provide it, and it seemed to be that even for NEC members, the there, there's you know that those those, those that information is not provided. And I think that's, 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 a real, that, that's really bad governance. That, that isn't good governance at all. Um, you can't be, I, I don't see how you could be an NEC member and not have access to that information. Now, I understand partly why it's not provided because there's a culture of leaking information from the NEC uh, and other parts of the Labour Party. And that, that is not good for the party. And, and you know, that, that, that um, it might give somebody a short term political advantage but long term it, it damages the party in a big way and if, if people are worried about that then that's something you know, you know we collectively need to put our hands up and say like, actually we're not going to allow leaks to happen and we, we need to we need to have that information shared and i think and i think that is a big part of so your overall question about the, the this challenge that that, that that people are talking about about funding clps and and and, and activity locally is, is first step towards that is transparency. The officer group get to see more detailed finance information, probably the monitoring report uh, quite regularly, uh, but the rest of the NEC don't get to see that. I think not every NEC member would 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 would, would have a, a, a finance background and you wouldn't expect them to. You, you'd want you know, a diverse range of expertise on, on the NEC, but there are some uh, who, who would and, and would have experience of looking at accounts and be able to dissect that in more detail than others. Um, but if you're not even provided the information, you know, I, on, on this call, there's 130 people, a good number of them will be local councillors. And, you know, in your local council, you get to see the finances, you have a finance committee, you get, it's all in the public domain, it's, it's, you know, there, there are some things which, which are kept back private because of commercial sensitivity, but most of the information is in the public. I, I'm a member of the West Midland Strategic Police and Crime Board and I sit on the Joint uh, Audit Committee for West Midland Police and, 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 and the uh, uh, Police and Crime Commissioner's Office. It's, you know, most of that information is in the public domain. Our meetings and our discussions and everything is, is done transparently. People on, on this call will be you know, trustees of local charities and, and, and groups right. and clubs and stuff. Um, I'm, I'm, I just can't see how. Are you, can I, sorry, can I just interrupt you because I'm just aware of the time. I just think, are you are you at all shocked by what you've heard about the the funding going on on the grassroots? Did you know that there were CLPs with no, fifty nine pounds in the bank? No, I, I, I'm not surprised by that. Uh, I think there has been a bit of a culture shift in recent years. I, I joined the party when I was 16, you know, 32 years ago, and, and things have changed over that time. I think there was a bigger culture of local parties doing fundraising locally uh, and doing more of that than there is now. Uh, and I see that in my own CLP. Um, I think that's part of it. I think, I mean, Martin from Solihull talked about how, you know, the, the, the answer isn't just about uh, dividing the cake in a different way. I think first it's understanding what the cake is and then making sure that it's divided in the right way 
um, and, and the right way, you know, there's a different meaning to that, as far as I'm concerned. Part of it is, is about how we win elections. I think that the example you started this, this, this call off with in terms of Broxtow was really powerful in terms of how local members can, can do this stuff. Um, but you know what? I think every single person on this call will be actively engaged in their community in one way or another. And, and our communities are very different and, and the challenges of what we need, you know, there, there isn't a one size fits all in terms of what uh, active community engagement or campaigning looks like on the ground. Um, but local people in those CLPs are the people who possess the knowledge of, and, the, and the best understanding of their communities and, and how to direct that. So I think another key uh, principle has to be uh, autonomy or some degree of autonomy. So whether it's the nation in terms of Scotland and Wales and stuff, or whether it's the region or whether it's CLP, we need to trust people to be able to direct spending. Well, well can, I, can I just, one, one quick question. Do you, do you think that that graph with, with £2.50 for CLPs and, and £47.50 for the main party, do you think that looks ridiculous? I, th I think there. I, I think it does. I think there, there, there's a there, there's certainly a big disparity there. Thank you very much, Gwinda, for coming on. I appreciate you coming on. Um, Anne. Yeah. Um, what do you make of all that you've heard? Um, just to say that it very much reflects what people were saying to me when I was on the NEC, and I think that the issues have become um, accentuated, and I think it's unfortunate because. The Party Democracy Review in 2018 didn't actually, it explicitly ruled out discussing finances, but so many CLPs, so many members raised it, that it was actually put in as a recommendation uh, from the review in 2018, and it needs to be followed up. We do have two CLP reps on the business board, and they will see the line-by-line -line details of the accounts. Um, what I wanted to say is actually is that um, uh, it seems like, well, it was a decade ago that the current party funding CIS framework was set up and it was actually, uh, there was very extensive consultation and it was agreed through the party's democratic structures. It wasn't snuck into conference on the Friday night before everyone turns up. But at that time, um, I looked back and CLPs got about a quarter, a third of membership subs, which is kind of ballpark figures what people are talking now. Okay, um, the lowest income CLP got £260 a year. The highest got over 8000 And that's what you get if you have a, a pro rata system, a fixed amount per membership. Um, so I do think it needs kind of thinking about if, if we go back to that, what, we, what that um, um, change did was it massively redistributed from large rich CLPs in London and the South East to small poor CLPs in the Hartlands and didn't they, actually, so, didn't they actually just distribute the money from large CLPs to the central party? Um, I don't see how the small CLPs would have benefited much if they were still only getting 150 or 250 a member. Well, this kind of ties into, and I appreciate very much the, I forget which CLP it was, which said they suddenly got a demand for so much to pay to the region and then so much to pay for the mayoral election and this kind of, um, we're not getting much money. And I'm a CLP secretary, so I mean, I see all this locally, but um, you, you're not getting much money anyway. And then we get demands for, you know, 500 pounds for this and a thousand pounds for that and, and that they're not optional so um I, I think that's something that has to stop and it's just a way of trying to get more back but originally um clp's got one pound 50 per member it's about two pounds 75 now uh it's index link so it goes up and it was only because of me that it's actually not still 150. But I also think that there's been a massive, massive change, and that's the increase in membership. In 2011, when this system came in, membership was under 200,000. It's now 550,000, 
fully paid up members. And that means that the money that isn't going back to CLPs and isn't being used to pay for election insurance and contact creating and so on is piling up. And there must be massive amounts in central funds, which is not going to CLPs in any way at all. And I think our NEC reps should actually find out how much money is in that fund. I think that the work that Broxco is doing wonderful, is wonderful and some of the other CLPs we've heard from. Uh, but um, uh, returning half the subscription money to CLPs does not guarantee that they will all go out and spend it as inspirationally as Broxco. Does. Well, it, you know, absolutely. It, autonomy means autonomy. Yeah, but we'll, means autonomy we'll have Jane on tour. Voice. Jane will be out on tour. Um, Boxdo yeah. will be on a roadshow, and we'll all have loads of checkbooks uh, to buy yes. property. This is this is my fantasy. Thank you, Anne. I'm going to move on now. Uh, finally, to John. Uh, you've waited very patiently there, John. Are you there? I'm here. Yes. Thank you very much for coming on the call. Um, so, uh, what's your take on what well, you've heard and, and the plight of CLPs? Because I'd just like to say, the community organising model is often spoken of favourably, but if you don't have any money, you can't really do much for your community. Look, that's absolutely right. Uh, can I first of all um, endorse what Garenda said about the democ the uh, a governance deficit. It is really quite terrible. I mean, for example, you've asked questions about um, the annual accounts. We've, I've never, I've, I've been on the NEC for two and a half years now, uh, much less than Anne was on it. Um, I, I've, you know, I've not been ever given a copy of the accounts. Um, we have a presentation once a year uh, from Simon Mills, who is the director of finance. Uh, we don't actually see, I don't see a lot of him. I, I've only seen him, I think, twice since I've been on the NEC uh, doing that annual presentation. He, he's based in Newcastle, so it's not so surprising, uh, you know, when we used to have physical meetings that, you know, in Southside that we didn't see him so much. Uh, I imagine that the business board and uh, officers see him a bit more. Um, and um, yes, it's quite right that the, the officers do see more information uh, and the business board do. By the way, uh, the minutes that we get from those bodies are uh, almost totally worthless. Um, we don't get the papers. Um, you know, it is, you know, there is no transparency on the NEC. It hasn't varied. Uh, you know, I've, I've so far had uh, been on, I've been there with, with two general secretaries, about to get the third, he hasn't started yet. Um, I, I hope we will see a change, um, but I'm not going to hold my breath. Um, the, so the accounts, we get, up, we get an annual presentation, uh, you know, which is on a screen, we're not even given a handout. Um, the only way I've seen the, the accounts, and I, I had another look at them before this meeting, uh, was by looking at the Electoral Commission website. Um, that's the first time I've seen the 2018 accounts, which is the most recent ones there. Uh, I think it was Martin actually uh, said uh, that um, it is, uh, you know, very centralised, top down, too centralised. Uh, you know, it, it needs to be devolved. I totally agree with that. I don't think it only needs to be devolved to CLPs, by the way. I think, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 there are probably other levels, uh, you know, city parties, you know, etc. cetera, um, uh, that, uh, that need money. Um, I'm a bit concerned. It's, I don't think it is just about membership fees. Uh, you know, I do worry, for example, a bit that um, the levies that council has paid, uh, you know, are effectively controlled by labour groups and or in, very often and, uh, or by leaders. I think, uh, you know, I do question whether that necessarily means that it's spent in the right way. I mean, obviously, we do want to spend more money on marginals and that, of course, should include marginal council seats as well as marginal parliamentary seats and, and, and seats for the Welsh Assembly and Scottish Parliament. Um, <coughs> but um, I do think it needs to be devolved. It's an urgent uh, priority. Um, 
I I would can, say. Can I, can I just interrupt you? What? Yeah, what sure. Go on, what you said so it's very alarming. What you've said about the you're not having access to accounts and information and the transparency mm -hmm. that we heard. Uh, from David about the actual not just accounts, account, Crispin. You know, I've never seen a budget. Uh, the the yeah. um, uh, you know, it's very hard. We had a meeting of the audit committee uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of concern about legal expenditure at the moment uh, for various reasons. I won't go into the details of, but you can probably guess some of them. Um, and uh, you know, we couldn't get a, a decent information about that. Um, so who, who's actually running the party? Because if his general secretaries keep changing, is it is it the, is it this Simon Mills with his checkbook? Well, I mean, I'm only well, joking. Well, what was the? I, I, I don't want to attack in any individuals because I, I, I you know, I, I uh, Simon in, Simon Mills is the finance director, uh, but uh, who's running the the party is is certainly not the NEC. Um, you know, we we don't see. Uh, you know, we don't have a grip on 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 expenditure or budgets. Um, I, I think the business board, I hope, do have more, but we don't. I, I you know, I don't know that for sure. Um, I, I think it's better than it used to be. I mean, Anne was there when we had a colossal when the party was in colossal debt, and that did result, I think, in the strengthening of. Uh, of the business board or the creation of the business board and uh, and, and the improvement of of uh, governance but it 's got a lot further to go we don 't have proper oversight in my view of of, of appointment processes i 'm not talking about the appointments themselves i 'm talking about processes i don 't you know there are there, we, we have very little scrutiny over um, you know dis, you know campaigning is 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 you know, the, the NEC has no real oversight of that? Can I, sorry, can I interrupt you once more? Um, I just want to say that um, I find it's quite disturbing, but at the same time, um, there's what well, I noticed when I was trying to promote this this show that not many MPs or people who work around the party were particularly keen on on a, a show about the finances of the party, and I'm just wondering if. There's such a, a, a sort of a clique of people or cronyism is going on that people don't want to open up the party and they don't want to make things, um, you know, uh, you know, like the, the accounts, make the accounts accessible, make the accounts understandable. You know, why we don't know about Labour Life and Black's been telling everyone how much Labour Life co costs, but the accounts won't tell us. So um, it's it's just. Do you want, as an NEC member, do you want us to, to go and support you to get more control? Definitely, yes. That would be very helpful. I'm, I'm sure that Gorinder and I completely agree on that, by the way, as I'm sure all the CLP reps do. All right, well, can you set up a petition and we'll all sign it and it says, can the NEC members actually start having a look at the um, party finances and start running it themselves, please? Um, <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I just want to say uh, that I, I found the show quite helpful today. Uh, it, we covered most of the country and it's clear that CLPs do not have enough funding to match yeah. Jane's example in Broxtow. And Jane's example in Broxtow would make a big difference practically to so many people. We saw food poverty is, is going to go crazy in the next few months when people who've been furloughed lose their jobs. We need to be out there helping. If we've got millions of pounds in a fund somewhere doing nothing, it's just the wrong thing to do. We should really have that money being used in the right way. Um, and to find out about the accounts not being uh, easy to, to read and, and stuff like that, and the NEC members not even knowing what the accounts are and what the budgets are, well, we've just got to sort this out because I don't think we can win elections unless we have a, a, a party that has integrity and a party that is devolved to the local level. Um, and uh, so that's what we've got to do. And I'm going to keep pushing this issue uh, all the time. <laughs>
Chippy's chip and plumber's plum. Attendants wait and waiters hurry. Tomato soup and potatoes curry. And boozers booze and teapots pour and bureaucrats no one knows for sure. Some painters paint, some painters splat, some poems rhyme like acrobats. Some painters painted Mona Lisa's flat and Mona Lisa's cat on Mona Lisa's mat. But the bureaucrats in their party hats put a stop to this and a stop to that. Oh, how they love their bureaucratic culture. The office and the banter and the chat. They say they're there because God is sometimes busy. But you're only never more than ten feet from a bureaucrat. If you can't play bass like a young Sid Vicious. And you've got no scruples and you're dull but still ambitious. If you can tell the time and people what to do. Then the bureaucrat is the life for you. And there's the state at your fingertips. And the bureaucrats count the paper clips. In the gulags, Dachau and Auschwitz. The bureaucrats.